and welcome to Red Review, a podcast where we talk about a variety of books from a Marxist and anarchist perspective. I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Clark. Thanks for joining me, Justin. Thank you for having having me, Corey. I always appreciate um, doing our show. I love doing it. Um, we're in the middle of the summer now. Um, as of recording, we're at the beginning of July. This year is going so fast. Yeah, no kidding. Um, and... <laughs> Uh, as we kind of discussed a bit in the pregame, um, you know, America's kind of going through kind of a loop this week <laughs> in terms of, um, you know, horrific Supreme Court decisions and sort of broader policy. Yep. Um, but, you know, I am the hopeless romantic in some respects, so I can't help but have a, still some f- slight tinges of, of, of love for my country. And with that in mind, I wanted to talk about, you know, because I do think that there's a lot within American history to be to be proud of and to be celebrated of, to be celebrated. And I think tonight's going to be a little bit of a part of that. So the way to set this up is, is that there's this sort of myth that persists that the founders were sort of free market libertarians. And now some of them were, some of them were sort of free market libertarians. But in general, the, the actual national economic policy that sort of led to the foundation of the United States wasn't actually that. Um, it was one right. um, that was based far more on the state playing a very large role in the development of the national economy. And there was no figure who had more impact on the history of the early republic and sort of set up what would become the United States than Alexander Hamilton. Um, and Alexander Hamilton is a figure that I've been obsessed with for years. Um, I wrote one of my first college papers on Alexander Hamilton and financial policy and banking. Um, I uh, I always like to say that I was sort of into Alexander Hamilton before it was cool. I, I used to sort of celebrate him before the shitty musical sort of celebrated him. Right. It's so funny because like people will ask me because they know how much of a sort of a Hamilton file I am. They'll be like, hey, what'd you think about the musical? And I'm like, I have to kind of grin and be nice, depending on who I'm talking to. It's not to. my favorite. But <laughs> it's great. It's great. You know, and I have to kind of, it's yeah. cringeworthy and awful. But like, <laughs> the, the only benefit is that it got people interested in learning about Hamilton, who I think is, you know, maybe outside of Thomas Jefferson, probably the most influential founding father in American history. Like he is the guy who created the country as it is. Um, there's actually this great quote um, that kind of sums up uh, why I think he is so important. And, and it's, um, it's actually from a conservative columnist, George Will, who wrote, there is an elegant memorial in Washington to Jefferson, but none to Hamilton. However, if you seek Hamilton's monument, look around. You are living in it. We honor Jefferson, but live in Hamilton's country, a mighty industrial nation with a strong central government. Um, which is true. So when we think about the early republic, we think about the founders um, or the framers. I know people like use the word framers. I'm old right. school. That makes me yeah. sexist. I don't care. I call them the fathers or the founders. Um, the founders really were mostly d- divided up into two camps. Um, you had the federalists and you had the anti-federalists. The anti-federalists or small d, the Democratic Republicans, people like Jefferson, um, who wanted a more limited, smaller government, a nation of sort of artisans and an agricultural republic. Everybody sort of had a 40 acres and a mule, and it was a sort of yeoman farmer democracy, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the other end were the Federalists, which were Hamilton, who wanted to build the nation, not just agriculturally, but industrially, that knew that industrial capitalism was going to be the future of the of the, of the world, right. and that in order to build the nation that we wanted to build, um, we would have had to do you know very strong state directed industrial policy, and that's Hamilton. Um, and so, with all of that in mind, um, tonight the book that we're doing, uh, and this book, I mean, some people always ask me, like, is there ever a book out there that feels like it was written for you? This is one that was felt like it was written for me. Okay. Um, it's one that I've wanted to write, read for a long time. I've had it on my shelf. I've been meaning to read it. Um, and I love it. And it's, uh, it's the book Radical Hamilton, um, Economic Lessons from a Misunderstood Founder by Christian Parenti. Now, you may notice that the last name is Parenti. This is yep. Michael Parenti's son. 
So we've done Michael Prenti on the show. Now we're doing Christian Prenti. He is the Associate Professor of Economics at John Jay College, the City University of New York. And he's written a variety of different books, uh, a lot of a lot of it in relation to the prison industrial complex and climate change. OK, um, this book is awesome. <laughs> I, I'm biased mainly just because, like, I I also think that Hamilton was awesome. So, like, it's it's very hard to be like, you know, objective. But I do think he does a wonderful job of saying what I've been saying to people for years, which is that Alexander Hamilton and his ideas about how to build a national economy are the very dichotomy of what the sort of free market ideology, the free market dogma on religion of America that persists to this day. The yeah. United States has never been a complete free market economy. It's never worked that way. No. Um, and if it did, it would never have been successful. Right. Um, and so, you know, Alexander Hamilton was the Treasury Secretary. He was a, the nation's, the United States' first Treasury Secretary under President George Washington. He served from 1789 through about 1794, 95. So he goes through most, he goes through all of Washington's first term and maybe a little bit of the second before he leaves. Okay. Um, and, uh, and of course, a lot of people, if they know anything about him, they know that he was killed in the duel. Um, that he died in a very famous duel in, in Weehawken, New Jersey, Burr, right? <laughs> in 1804, and Aaron Burr, who was the sitting vice president, killed him in a duel. Um, some people have argued that Alexander Hamilton kind of had a death wish, especially after the death of the, the more recent, at the time, the recent death of his son. Um, and so, like, people think that he just was, you know, and he also had to survive a very horrific scandal involving infidelity, you know. History shows us that Hamilton was kind of a ladies man. <laughs> okay. Um that uh but uh he liked women quite a bit. Um so when he wasn't writing uh treatises on how to develop a national economy, he was, you know, he was getting around. Uh but um and uh and some speculate even with his own wife's sister, which is interesting. Um but uh but anyway, <laughs> so um Alexander Hamilton was vastly influential in terms of the development of the early United States. And he is, and he is very influential through a series of reports that he writes. So he wrote sort of three. He writes okay. one on the national debt, he writes one on the banking system, and he writes one on manufacturers. Okay. Um, the banking system one is the one that most people know. Hamilton created what was called the National Bank of the United States. It was a precursor to the Federal Reserve. Um, and, uh, and so Central banking, the idea that a state has one central bank that controls the currency instead of having multiple different institutions trying to control the currency at any given time, um, which is how it was in American history before Hamilton um, mm -hmm. and in a lot of American history after Hamilton, too, um, to disastrous results. And Prenti gets into that in the latter part of the book. Um, but. Prenny correctly notes that like not I mean, as many people have written about the report on manufacturers. Um, so, for example, uh, Ron Chernow, who's written probably the book on Alexander Hamilton that most people have read. It's the one that that Lynn manuel Miranda read when to write Hamilton the musical. Okay. It's like a thousand page book. It's enormous. He spends very few pages dedicated to the report on manufacturers. <laughs> um when I was in college writing about Hamilton, I read the report on manufacturers. It was a part of the Library of America edition of Hamilton's writings. And it's it's not the easiest prose to read. It's late 18th century prose. He's also a nerd. So it's like it kind of reads kind of nerdy and wonky. Right. But it's genius. What he's arguing for is essentially genius. Um, and what he argues for is that the United States should develop its economy on three main pillars. One, the development of a well-regulated uh, public national debt. Two, the creation of a centralized banking system. And okay. three, direct public investment and regulation of the manufacturing industry. So it goes beyond merely just like tweaking around the edges. It's actually using the state as a means to develop, an indus develop industries. The term that Hamilton uses is he calls it the means proper um, in his okay. reports. Um, and it's something that, uh, you know, that um, 
uh, Parenti argues that that phrase, the means proper, is something that every American should know just as well as we know, like we the people or, right. you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. We should know the means proper. It's very important. The other term that's used for it is dirigiste, which just means di- more direct. The state plays a very central role in the development of an economy. Okay. Um, this would then develop into what in the 1820s was championed by U.S. Senator Henry Clay, who was Lincoln's biggest political influence. Um, so by virtue of that, Lincoln's largest political influence is really Hamilton because Clay's was Hamilton. Um okay developed uh, a series of what were called internal improvements today, what we would call infrastructure that was direct public investment in the development of infrastructure in the United States. And that was what was called the American system. Um, And then eventually would be called the national system and economies from Germany to Japan, to Korea, to today, today's China have all followed the Hamilton blueprint of strong public investment in and development of industry and the economy through strong centralized institutions of banking, finance, and manufacturing. Um, So that's kind of the setup for the broader stuff that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, And with that, I'll leave it open for anybody who is joining us. Yeah, we got uh, over on YouTube, we got Kerrigan. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, And Demand Better World. Hello, hello. Thank you and for being here. And then over on uh, Twitch, we've got Nonsequently. Well, hello, hello. Thank you for being here, too. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that uh, we can we can kind of start talking about how did Hamilton come to these ideas? You know, who, who is Hamilton? Alexander Hamilton um, uh, was born in on the island of Nevis is in the West Indies. It's in the Caribbean. Um, And he was famously a bastard child. He was someone who his mother had him out of wedlock when she was married to someone else and she had her her, her child with him. Um, And he starts, he actually kind of starts working at the age of 12. He's kind of a prodigy. He's reading like dense economic and historical texts in his tweens, if you will. Right. And he starts becoming an accountant and a bookkeeper. And all of these experiences lead up to him eventually coming to the United States. Um, he, he goes to preparatory school in New Jersey. Then he goes to King's College, which is now Columbia University in the U.S. Um, and then eventually he would become a very important role in the American Revolution. So when the American Revolution began, um, in, in 1775, with the shots heard around the world, the Lexington and Concord, and of course, the Declaration of Independence, which is in 1776. Uh, Hamilton becomes a part of uh, the military. He eventually becomes um, the, the, large, the sort of most substantial aide to George Washington, um, who was the head of the Continental Army. And it's his experiences in the war that change him. They're the things that sort of lead him to being who he is. Um, and sometime in sort of 1777, 1778, he has what is referred to as like a crisis. It's in the winter of, eight, of 1777, 1778. Um, for all intents and purposes, he has a nervous breakdown. Um, oh. the, the, the weight of the war and all that's going on is on him so heavily. And... Out of this crisis emerges the ideas and the concepts that would embolden him to develop his broader economic view of what the American Republic should be. And um, as he, as a Parenti would write, as if in communication with an industrialized future that only he could see, this is the man who would design America's financial system and lay out the template for its industrialization. Now, why is he so obsessed with all of this? For lack of a better word, the early American Revolution is an omni shambles. It's it's a it's a you know it's a cluster, if you will. Um, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the time. I don't want to curse before we. I don't want us to get demonetized. Fifteen minutes in, so 
15 <laughs> minutes in, right? So we're 15 minutes in. Okay. So the American Revolution was a clusterfuck right. in a variety of ways. <laughs> so let me explain why. Part of it is, is that there was no national currency. So um, states would often, states and territories and commonwealths often generated their own currency or sort of, um, and then they would have sort of uh, bills of credit that were often tied to real assets. So back in the day, you know, most money, you had hard money, which was called specie, which is like gold and silver or commodities. And then you had paper money. Um, and the paper money was almost always backed up by gold, silver, or some kind of commodities. Right. There was no centralized system for any of that. So, um, so some soldiers would then sort of defect or they would just like go back home because they weren't being paid. Um, or if they were being paid, the money was eventually worthless. Right. Um, and so there's all these kinds of problems that run into it. The other problem is, is that you have sort of a very decentralized money system which leads to a lot of economic chaos. You have a very decentralized political system, which also leads to a tremendous amount of chaos. In the early American Revolution, sometimes the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. Right. And in those cases, um, there was serious problems in terms of trying to win trying to win battles and trying to successfully build the war effort in order to beat the British. Mm -hmm. And so um, the other part of it was disease. Disease was horrific. In the the American Revolution, people died of of typhus, typhoid, um, consumption, or what they call tuberculosis, yeah. um, all kinds of horrific diseases because there were no um, because there were no uh, there were some forms of systematic inoculation, specifically against smallpox, which were um, actually instigated by George Washington. I love bringing this up because libertarians collectively, they, they lose their fucking minds over the founders. They worship them like gods. Right. But yet a lot of them are also like anti-vaxxer morons. And I'm like, do you know that the first vaccine mandate in America was during the American Revolution? And it was done by George Washington himself. Yeah. Um, just like watch their fucking heads explode. But, um, you know, but in the earlier years of the revolution, you know, Hamilton sounds much more like a Jeffersonian Democrat. He's like, you know, we, you know, we have to have, um, you know, we have to have like looser social bonds. We have to create a more small decentralized system. But out of the crisis of 1777 to 78, he is no longer this sort of romantic small D Democrat. He becomes what Prenti calls the brut brutally pragmatic naturalist, which is true. So, in statecraft, there are two things that have to happen, and they are symbiotic to one another. One is the development of a national economy. Mm -hmm. And that national economy then leads to the development of a national military, of a national defense. And those two go hand in hand, and they've always gone hand in hand in the development of states, period. Yeah. Hamilton understands this core truth, and he knew that if the nation was not strong economically, it would not be strong militarily, and we would lose the revolution. So this is where, starting in the in the in the revolutionary period, Hamilton starts kind of laying the groundwork for a lot of what he's going to do later. And some of that is with his organization of troops and his successful um, uh, organization of the armed forces to win certain battles and to help uh, General Washington. Um, other of them is. Uh, um, sort of his critiques to state governors, to specifically New York Governor George Clinton, um, to sort of lay out the problem of like the degeneracy of the currency, the degeneracy of representation. Um, and uh, with all of that, um, it all kind of leads into the idea of what he sort of kind of calls for a proto-constitutional convention in years before it would actually happen. Um, and with all of that, uh, you see in the period that you see the beginnings of the industrialization of the country. So you have the development of, of early industries, whether it's textiles, um, gunpowder, uh, weapons, guns, right. uh, food, all these nascent industries that are starting to pop up. And what he notices is that some states actively take part in developing these industries through what we would today call deficit spending. Right. Um, and so, uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting how 
he sort of develops these ideas in the context of the revolution. He's seeing everything that's going on around him. He's seeing the chaos that needs to have that has needs to have order brought to it. And then simultaneously, he's seeing how economic development is, in fact, in many ways, spurned, you know, sort of spurred by and encouraged by the war. And especially this is the case when it comes to, like I said, with guns or whatever. It's also with shipbuilding. Um, so shipbuilding goes through the roof. Um, and so and at the same time, you also have all of these consumers. So you're now developing a national conser- consumer base in a way that never really existed before. Mm. These are all things that were happening during the revolution that would influence Hamilton's ideas about the developing of the national economy. Um, and with that, I'll stop again to see if we have any questions, comments. Uh, no, new, no new comments. Okay. <laughs> um, so everybody's listening rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you can see that he's dealing with all of these like myriad problems and he's trying to, to figure out ways to combat them. The other problem is, as we mentioned before, with the money, not only do you have a decentralization of currencies, but you have rapid inflation. Um, and so um, when the inflation happened, it was extremely haphazard because some institutions would do certain form of promissory notes and others would do different forms of promissory notes. And those weren't and those policies weren't done in conjunction. So you had a lot of varying degrees of, of value being left into the currency itself. Mm. Um, the other problem is that taxation policy wasn't very good either. So, you know, tax collecting was almost non-existent. The tax collecting that was being done was still under, was still under what it could have been. There's again, no standardization of the tax collecting system. Uh, and so that also really does, I mean, it, it ravages the sort of early revolutionary economy. Um, and specifically the national dollar, the continental dollar, um, its value, um, drops by over 70% between 1775 and 1777. So all of these things are, 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 are kind of happening at the same time. And what Hamilton is doing when he's on Washington's staff is he's developing, okay, what can we do to, to, to solve this problem? Um, and he says the real problem is that the inflation is not the cause. Inflation is the symptom. The real cause is economic underdevelopment. Mm-hmm. Because if you had more economic development in the country, then you'd have more goods and services purchased, which means that the value of the money would be more directly correlational to those those goods and services being created, which means that the, the money would ultimately be worth things. Right. Then it wouldn't be otherwise. So, um, so and, and the other thing he all often thought of, too, and this sort of presages what he would do later on in the early Republic period, is he argued for foreign loans, which is something that eventually would happen, specifically the country of France. And this is where I want to say that there's a very interesting parallel between the American Revolution and the Russian Revolution. Okay. Um, and there will be two little parallels we'll talk about tonight because um, – uh, he, there's a part of the book where he actually actively talks about how Hamilton and some of his ideas is very is very similar to Lenin. So okay. um, if you look at the history of the Russian Revolution, one of the things you learn right away is that the largest one of the largest financial and political supporters of the revolution was the German government. Their thought was, well, if, the, the, if, if Russia can fall to the Bolsheviks, then uh, we no longer have to fight them in, in World War I. That they're no longer an enemy, which is exactly what happened. So when you know Lenin's legendary train ride in the spring of 1917, you know the Finland station going back into Saint Petersburg, um, that was a train that was commissioned by the Germans. They gave him money. Right. You know, it was all cynical on their end, right? And it was cynical for the book and for the and it was pragmatic and cynical to a certain extent for the Bolsheviks too. They're like, fuck it, we'll take their money and then we'll overthrow their country. Um, you know, we'll overthrow their monarchy and s- install a communist government there too. So this is the thing where you get this sort of thing of, oh my God, you know, Lenin's like the secret agent for the Germans or whatever. And it's like, no, that's not really what it was. It was They just saw an con- advantage. Yeah. It was two countries seeing an advantage and t- and exploiting each other's advantages for their own gain, right? Yeah. This is exactly what happens during the American Revolution too. Um, so Benjamin Franklin uh you know one of the founding fathers was the emissary to France during the revolution and he was he was instrumental in securing both materiel 
and loans from the French government Mm -hmm. because the French hated the British. The French had just lost in the French and Indian War to, and or the Seven Years' Wars, it's called, in Europe to Britain in the 1750s and 60s. So they're like, you know what? This is our way to get back at them while helping these other people that we actually like. Yeah. So does that make Benjamin Franklin an agent of the French government? To me, but French, you know, Franklin using the French is no different than Lenin using the Germans. It's just for their, it's for their own political gain. Yeah, that's right. And it's just, that's just pragmatic statecraft. And so a lot of what Hamilton was calling for in terms of, 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 of loans that would then allow us to have capital on the international market, which would allow us to have certain forms of trade with nations, whether it be, you know, um, France or Spain. And then uh, that would help the domestic economy. Because then people could then, you, they could then produce the goods and services that would not only be used in the war effort, but could also be exported out. Um, and so all of this tends to actually help the, the broader economy in general. Um, and so if you look at, um, if you look at what we think about with the national economic policy, you know, the sort of economic nationalism of Hamilton, there's a quote of his, um, in, I believe this is either in the Federalist Papers or later on, where he talks about the means proper. The new government needed the power of regulating trade, determining with what countries it shall be carried on, granting indulgences, laying prohibitions on all articles of export or import. So that's like taxes um, or you know forms of um, 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 tariffs. Um, imposing duties, granting bounties and premiums for raising, exporting, importing, and applying to their own use. The product of these duties. Again, very kind of garbled language. It's very tortured. You know, he's late 18th century. But what is the main lesson out of this? Is that a new state should have a national credit and financial system that would coin money and rate and establish banks. It would have, um, regulating international trade and also having uh, you know, tariffs or, or excises on certain things coming in. So you could have higher tariffs on exports in order to boost domestic production to a place where it's good enough to then be exported out. Um, and then lower taxes on, on, on exporting things out, um, that would eventually be developed. Um, and so these, and, and the raising of this tax revenue would then be used to develop macroeconomic national policy in terms of developing industry. Hmm. So again, it's those three main pillars. It's creating well-regulated debts, which creates a national credit system, which is indispensable for a country, two, a national banking system to create uniformity and most importantly, uh, a trust or faith in the system, hmm. and three, um, uh, regulations and protections and investments in development of domestic production. Mm -hmm. Those are all core values of the Hamiltonian system. And when the war ends in 1783, we enter into what's called the critical period. It's what scholars call it, the critical period, Um, which is a term they actually get from another sort of adjacent founding father, although he's not directly a founding father, but he's the son of one. And that's John Quincy Adams, oh, who yeah. is also a Hamiltonian. Um, and uh, so he uses that term critical period. So there's this period of time between the end of the Revolutionary War and the drafting and creation of the Constitution. Mm. Because people just assume America has always lived under the Constitution. It has not. Um, from the Revolution through to 1787, the United States lived under a governing document called the Articles of Confederation, which was a much more limited um, and decentralized state system that was ultimately disastrous. It didn't work very well, and it kind of fell apart during the critical period. Mm. As it's falling apart, there you start seeing more mutinies um, of, of revolutionary soldiers and then revolutionary veterans. Um, you also see... Um, the development of, uh, you know, radical political factions. So in Rhode Island, for example, they sort of throw all of the, the sort of the, um, they throw all of the sort of elites in the state out of power and they sort of institute this, this kind of workers or more pro people government in Rhode Island, um, which is kind of interesting because they're responding to the fact that 
the Revolutionary War debt, which is held by the states. Each state holds Revolutionary War debt. Then the government of the United States, the nation as a whole, has Revolutionary War debt. Mm. So um, all of this is, and because of all of this debt that's being hung over the American populace, because it's decentralized and deregulated debt, um, it ravages local economies, so much so that people start having revol revolts. Right. And this is where we get the famous Shays Rebellion. So Daniel Shays was a Revolutionary War veteran um, who um, became sort of the leader of this um, of this sort of revolt. He sort of represented uh, a lot of these um, growing organizations uh, that were fighting against uh, the oppressive debts of the war. Okay. And so uh, let me pull up a little bit more about him. So he devotes a whole chapter to Daniel Shays. Um, so the Shays Rebellion is really the culmination, uh, what, what Franny calls the culmination of the crisis. It's like, this is where all the things come to head. So even though Shays is not the only person carrying out rebellions or sort of um, revolts against the national government in terms of its its appropriation of resources from the from the debt, but he represents kind of one of the key leaders of it. Okay. So, um, so he was a veteran. Um, he was one of the many leaders, uh, but he was but he was sort of the lead guy. He became kind of the scapegoat that the people used. Um, and Shays was typical of the rebellion that would bear his name, Prenti writes. He had served in the Continental Army, fighting valiantly at Bunker Hill, Ticonderoga, Saratoga, and Stony Point. The Marquis de Lafayette, another very key Revolutionary War figure, um, even awarded Shays a ceremonial sword. But in peacetime, the indebted yeoman farmer was forced to sell it. So this is in Massachusetts. Um, and it was a complete and total breakdown of the national system. Mm. Um, and often the way the story is told is that when the Constitutional Convention is held in 1787, it is in many respects a counter-revolution. And you can make the argument that it is, that you could say that, you know, uh, the, the more loose, decentralized, um, you know, Articles of Confederation was a more democratic system. The, the Constitution created a stronger central government, which in many respects was maybe less democratic than the Articles of Confederation. That's right. an argument that's often made. That's the Jeffersonian argument. Um, the reason that it's called the Jeffersonian argument is because the reason that the Jeffersonians revolted against the Constitution was that essentially the Constitution had enough of it, uh, enough in it early on that would lead to um, a very fierce debate on slavery mm -hmm. and ultimately ending of slavery in America. So uh, I apologize for not going for going over 30 minutes and talking about the United States, the founding of the country without talking about slavery. It's a very key component. So some people call it the counter-revolution of 1776. That's Gerald Horne's book. Um, there are certain arguments for that. I think some of that's partly the case, but um, but I don't really think it, it gets to the heart of what Hamilton thought and sort of what Hamilton thought would be better for the country as a whole. Okay. So you can say in many ways that the Constitution was both a democratic document and an aristocratic document. And that's essentially the argument that H Prenti makes. Um, it was, a, as he calls it, a brokered text. It was both. It had elements that were deeply democratic and it had other ones that were deeply aristocratic. Yeah. The ways in which it was deeply aristocratic was the, the non-direct election of U.S. senators. So America before um, the early 19-teens, um, 1913, 1914, um, you didn't have direct election of senators. Um, mm. They were elected by legis state legislatures. So it was much more of a parliamentary system where voters would vote for a party to be in power in a state legislature, and that state legislature would, would choose the senator. So this, again, is a check on power. You have the electoral college, which is the system of how a president is elected, where the president isn't directly elected by the popular vote. Right. The president is elected via the electors, and states have a certain number of electors, and in our system, generally, the popular vote winner of the of the the state election wins the electoral votes and then right. wins the presidency. Um, but they're under no obligation to do that. Um, I think, in some ways, if you look at Hamilton's reading of the document, um, and people often sort of said, "Oh, well, he's an aristocrat. He wanted an American monarch, and this and that and the other." Some of that's true, but at the same time. 
he also was much more interested in developing national economic policy. And the, mm. and the Constitution gave the American government far more power to do that than the Articles of Confederation did. So you can make the argument that it's more democratic in the sense that it built a stronger central government, which created a much more um, stable and and um, cohesive system that ultimately allowed for the growth of the national economy, which would then lead to the broader prosperity of the public, which I think is true. I think if you okay. look at the 1990s, um, I think that's absolutely the case. Um, am I breaking up on your end? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. So I'll just repeat briefly, because um, I don't know what's going on with my computer. Um, what's going on? Oh, no. No, yeah, you're like frozen, hey? I, can you hear me still? I can still hear you, yes. Okay, give me a second here. Um, I don't know what's going on. Um, oh, my goodness. Um, oh, my on. Yeah, everybody um, can hear you. Well, uh, some random geek says they can hear you, uh, but uh, yeah, it okay. looks like you Hold have on. slow internet for some reason. So, okay, not sure. My computer just decided to make a to take a massive dump. Hold on, let me see if I can get my my camera back. Okay, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, oh no, I don't know why this is doing this. Like my computer is like freezing up. Uh oh. Yeah, it just decided to, to take a collective crap. Um, it was back. I don't know. Um, let's see. Let me try that. Okay, I think I'm back. I don't know what that was about. Right. I have no idea what that was about. Um, oh man, it's like still freezing. Um, give me a minute. Yep. Um, let me just. Uh, I'm not All sure. Right. Yeah, if you want to uh, go out and come back in, I can. Uh, okay, try to I'll entertain. Do that. Try to entertain the folks for a minute. Okay, give me. Give, let me do that real quick. All right. Thank you. Um, All right. Well, I'll, I'll just wait until uh, Justin comes back, and we'll see if. Uh, yeah, hopefully it works out. But uh, let's see. We got uh, demand better world. You asked. Let's see, what do you guys think of the recent moves by? B-R-I-I-C-S-U-E-E -E, to establish global trading currency to reduce reliance on the U.S. dollar. I don't know anything about that, but it sounds like a good idea to not be so reliant on the U.S. So, so there's that, I guess. And then uh, I'll bring this up to Justin when he gets back. Uh, some random geek asked, uh, did the Boxer Rebellion happen around the same time? And I'm not. Again, another thing I don't know. <laughs> um. Demand better world. What do you got there? Speaking of national debts, do you think that China selling off so much American debt, six hundred billion dollars of bond in last year alone, will help countries with IMF, WB, U.S. debt traps? I do not know how that will happen. How that? What the effect of that will be? You would almost think so, but uh, it, you know, the U.S. they like to have their their uh, influence on other countries, so it's it's entirely possible that they'll still. Yeah, they'll still have a lot of influence. Plus, they're like the largest military might in the world or something like that right now. So so that's not good either. They can always threaten to bomb people. Uh, some random geek. So we're talking about the Lin-Manuel Miranda being radical then, right? Uh, I don't know about Lin-Manuel Miranda, but uh, yeah, Hamilton anyway. Uh, some random geek. Fuck the IMF slash WB. Absolutely. Yeah. We, uh, I guess if uh, people viewing want to read more on the IMF, there's like uh, uh, Naomi Klein's book uh, on, what's it called again? The Disaster Capitalism, uh, The Shock Doctrine, that's what it's called. That's a very good book, talks a lot about like the impact of like the IMF and debt on uh, various countries. <clears throat> Some random geek says, just forgive the debt in poorer countries. I have to, I have to agree with that. They, uh, they absolutely should just like, it's like the, uh, like Africa, right? Like when South Africa was gaining independence after apartheid, it was pretty like shitty of America and the IMF to like 
heap a bunch of debt on them and like enforce certain economic policies that basically screw them over when there's like a struggling country that had lots of resources. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I have no idea what that was all about. Sorry, guys. Uh, no worries. Here, I collectively quit on me. <laughs> I riff for a little bit. It'll all get deleted in the edited version. <laughs> oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. That's fine. So thank you. So anyway, what I was saying was, with the development of a national economic system under the Constitution, in many respects, was a lot more democratic than before. But there are deeply, deeply problematic aspects of the Constitution, especially in relation to slavery. So the slavery question was not solved um, or issue or, or figured out really during the Constitutional Convention. This is where you get the infamous three fifths clause of the Constitution, which meant that slaves counted three fifths of a person. The reason that was put in there was because um, the white population of the southern states of the country, the early republic, had far fewer white people than the North did. And so the North would dominate American politics if it was just based upon white property owning men as voting yeah. as a voting bloc. So in order to counteract that, you have the three fifths clause because there were millions and millions of enslaved um, black people in the South. And so they counted as three fifths of a person. So that's how you balance that out in terms of proportionality for both the Congress and for the Senate. What you see in the Hamiltonian system is it's it's northern industrial, stronger central government, stronger macroeconomic policy. This is constantly fighting against the Jeffersonian system, which is decentralized, less stronger central government, more emphasis on the slaves, because Jefferson was somebody, a lot of people in the South were sort of slave, um, they were slave rich, and they were cash poor. Mm -hmm. And in the national manufacturing economy, industrial economy that Hamilton wanted to build, being slave rich and money poor was bad. It didn't right. work. So it actually, it lent itself to being more democratic in the long run, because it ultimately would lead to the dynamics that would... Um, uh, eventually de develop into the northern industrial system, which beat the South in the Civil War. It's yeah. sad it took a civil war to get to that place, but the Hamiltonian policies of a stronger national economy predicated on central banking and industrial and industrial um, might um, ultimately were the things that made sure that the North won, that the Union won during the Civil War. So even though you know it, it was a horrific, you know, over six hundred twenty thousand Americans died in the Civil War. It was ultimately a second American revolution that made the country better. Yeah. And that couldn't have happened under the Articles of Confederation. It couldn't have happened. It could have right. only happened under the, um, under the Constitution. So one of the things that's very interesting is Hamilton has this kind of very radical idea um, that on the surface could seem as if it's a power grab, but would actually be kind of a good thing. Um, and that is he actually argued at the Constitutional Convention for dissolving the states. He thought that you could break the country up into electric di election districts, um, but then states would have less power and the central government, the states wouldn't exist. And you'd only have the national government and then the national government would set policy. And then you'd have elec election districts that would then set policy. Now, people could say, well, that sounds like a blatant power grab and centralization of power. However, as Parenti correctly points out, in retrospect, the abolition of states would have avoided some rather major problems, such as the Civil War. Without state governments, their fragmented micro-sovereignties and their gray-clad state militias, Southern secession would have been far more difficult. Without states, there would have been no state control of elections, thus no electoral college, thus no minority rule by presidents like George W. Bush and Donald Trump, men who lost the popular vote yet won majorities in the electoral college. I think that's a good point, which is that there's this kind of allergy in our modern age to bigness. Um, and we've talked about this before in the podcast and sort of talking about Lee Phillips or we've talked about degrowth or whatever. Right. Um, I don't have an allergy to bigness. Um, I think big pop problems require big solutions. Um, this is where I think maybe you and I might be the most different. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that we have national and international problems that are really only, in my opinion, only going to be solved by national and international solutions under the current system. Um, and so he, he actually has a critique of this at the beginning of the book where he says, like, whether it's small government conservatives arguing about how government is the worst thing ever, or people on the left saying that we don't need these big solutions, we should do these smaller things, 
um, there's both this sort of allergy to bigness. Mm -hmm. The thing is, I think some of that's well-founded. I think we can certainly have a critique of centralization, of larger power, of bureaucracy. We've certainly talked about that on the podcast. Sure. At the same time, same time, I don't really think in that to build the kind of world that we want to build, we have to pull from the toolkit that is a big kit that has us do big things in order to solve big problems. Um, yeah. I don't, so that that's, and now having said that, does that mean that we, I, cause I don't think that solving big problems with big solutions and having them be democratic are antithetical to one another. I think, no. I think they can go together. Yeah. I think it just has to be done. Right. Like, uh, I find, I find like uh, a country the size of America with 330 some million people, that's untenable. You, <laughs> you know, like I find that that has to be broken up into smaller regions that maybe could do a kind of a democratic federalism where they, you know, uh, they would communicate and barter and deal with each other, sort of like states do, but without that overarching kind of like this is your authority government kind of thing. Yeah. And I think, and essentially that that's kind of what the United States already is. I mean, if, if of, you yeah. look, you know, um, is that you have in the federal system of the United States, you have the national government, you have the States, and then you have the localities and then you have the people. Right. Um, and so um, the thing that's interesting is that for me, at least, if you look at times, of great progress in American history, they didn't happen because we made things smaller. Um, whether yeah. it's the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, Brown v. Board, uh, the regulation of the trusts in the Progressive Era, the development of a national banking system, all these things which ultimately did bring a lot of you know, peace and prosperity to people, although very unevenly. Very, um, yeah. very okay. unevenly, right? But not because, again, not necessarily because of its bigness, but because of its built-in biases by people who were against national policy. Yeah. So he has a chapter in the book about how a lot of the reforms that Hamilton wanted ended up getting undermined during the subsequent presidencies of Jackson. Uh, well, not before Jackson, but also Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and then ultimately Andrew Jackson, um, which leads the country into... Um, one of the worst economic crises it's ever had, and that's the Panic of 1837. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, I, you know, this is where for me, I think that, um, I think that maybe the idea of dissolving the states goes too far. Having said that, I do think that the problem of American politics really does stem from certain states having more power than others that's unwarranted. Um, and that goes back into the problem of the, the Constitution originally being pro-slavery and sort of putting a thumb on the scales for the South in the right. way that it wouldn't do ultimately for the North. And so one of the things that's interesting is that he makes a note of in the, Con in, in the Constitutional Convention is that um, the reason that it ended up being a pro-slavery document wasn't necessarily because um, uh, the... The people who are part of the Constitutional Convention, only a, only a handful of them were genuinely sort of zealous, what are called zealous partisans of slavery, as historian James Oakes calls it. So in the broader Constitutional Convention, which is made up of scores of people, you had some who were like virulent slave, slavers. You know, they were, they were, they were very much believed that slavery was a, a national birthright, that that was something that they was, that was, uh, that was granted to them under the, and it should be granted to them under the constitution. Simultaneously also did have abolitionists. There were abolitionists at the constitution. Convention. Right. The vast majority of the delegates, to the constitution convention, including Hamilton were somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Now Hamilton himself was an abolitionist. Now through marriage, he did, his family did have slaves, but later in life, he would actually join the, one of the New York abolition societies and, and would um, no longer own slaves. Benjamin Franklin is the same, is the same story where in his earlier life, he, he had like two or three slaves. He would, um, uh, I think either, I think some of those that were freed, I'm not exactly sure, but he eventually no longer has slaves and, and is one of the founders of the 
Philadelphia Anti-Slavery Society. So right. you see founders get better over time on the issue of slavery. And this isn't just the founders. Not too. Thomas Jefferson, but... <laughs> Not Thomas Jefferson, who was probably the most virulent slave enslaver of them all. Because he yeah. was, in his lifetime, he had, at any given time, 600 people under bondage. Yeah. So did James Madison. And what's interesting is that you see that the those who are calling for stronger central government, and stronger national economic and, and military policy are generally on the side of abolition or they're ambiguous on the issue of slavery. Yeah. They very much believed what a lot of the Whig tradition, the Federalists, which would become the Whigs, which would become the Republican Party under Lincoln, was that slavery is a horrific thing and that our goal is to eventually... Our, fight for the gradual gradual end of slavery in the country. That was the broader, that was what, that was the plan. That didn't happen, right? right? Because of, that didn't happen because of Compromise of 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act, and ultimately the Dred Scott decision, and ultimately the Civil War. Like, there were a series of things that happened that yeah. gave the slaver, the enslavers and the slave power and the slave aristocracy more and more power over time. And that undermined the broader national mission. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, to me, there's a through line from Hamilton to Henry Clay to Lincoln. And from there, it's again, and it's getting more um, not it's not it's not just going from gradual emancipation and colonization. It's going into full emancipation and political rights. So by the time you get to the end of Lincoln's life, he's advocating for black suffrage. One of the final speeches that he gives, which is the speech that takes James John Wilkes John Wilkes Booth over the edge, and ultimately led to his assassination, and then you have eventually the Fifteenth Amendment of the Constitution, right. which which allowed for black suffrage, at least for black male suffrage. Yeah. So all of that would not happen without a stronger central government and the Constitution. These are the, you know, and for right or wrong, right? That is that is the historical history. That's that, the historical that's record. how it went. Yeah. Like, and that's not to say that it couldn't be better. I mean, I do think the Constitution could be a much better system. I mean, to me, if I was designing a new Constitution, we talked a little bit about this in the pregame, but like if I was designing a national Constitution, we would move more to like a parliamentary system. Um, in the United States, House of Representatives terms are two years. I would change that to four, so they're elected with the president. Hmm. Um, and uh, and then I and then Senates Senates can still stay at six because it's the upper house. Um, that checks that the the lower house of the House of Representatives. It's fine to keep them at six year terms, but the, I, the idea of House terms being only two years is absurd. Like do away with that. Yeah. Um, I would put more enforcement on congressional oversight of the judiciary um, to sort of claw back power from the judicial branch, um, and I would also put more um, uh, uh, checks and balances upon the executive branch, particularly in the ways of foreign policy and, and war making. Um, Congress reassert itself on the issue of war powers. Those are all things like my impulses in writing a national constitution would be able to be very radical in the sense that like I would do sort of, I would write into the constitution like a, a, um, a worker's bill of rights or a second bill of rights as, as FDR called it. Everyone is entitled not just to free speech and freedom of religion and due process under the law, but every American is entitled to a job. Every American is entitled to a home. Every American is entitled to universal health care. I would build those into my national constitution. Yeah. I would also build, I would also build into the national constitution, uh, incentives and legalizing both unionization and worker cooperation. Those would all be built into my constitution. At the same time, I would have sort of small C conservative impulses in limiting some of the powers of the judiciary, the executive and the legislative branches. So it's, it's a balance. Um, I can stop there if we've got com comments. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we've got, I'll go, I'll start at the end and come okay. back. Okay. So, uh, we got, uh, some random geek, some random geek just commented. What about the fact that the Senate had two sen has two senators for each state despite population? Yes, I think that's something. So when the Senate was originally designed, the goal for that was that at the Constitutional Convention, there was a very large debate over what should mean more, population or geography. Hmm. And ultimately, population won, but the compromise was the U.S. Senate. Right. So 
Um, certain founders uh, argued for something a little bit more radical. Um, so Thomas Paine, um, you know, probably my other favorite founder besides Hamilton, um, Paine argued for a unicameral legislature. It would just be one house, and it would be directed elected. It would be directly elected by the people. Ultimately, they ended up on the compromise. You know, the Constitution is an extremely compromised document. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of a hodgepodge, it, it, but in, some of it works very well, and some of it's really bad. It, but it's the oldest national constitution in the history of the world. So on some level, it succeeds, question mm -hmm. mark, so but that's... it's there. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you look at uh, the Senate, it is just two, right? So it doesn't matter what your population is. And so the state like Wyoming, which I always make a joke of like, that's a state that has probably more like wildlife than it has people um, or more caribou than it has people. Um, has the same amount of senators as a state like California or New York, or Florida yeah. or Texas. Um, and the reason it was that way was because the, how, the U.S. Congress was developed in many ways kind of like parliament. In the U.K., you have the House of Lords and you have the House of Commons. The lower house is the House of Commons. The upper house is the House of Lords. The House of Commons is directly elected by the people. And the House of Lords... I, I think it's probably directly elected by the people now, or it might be elected from the legislators in the lower house. When the constitution in America was originally developed, senators were, were not directly elected by the public. They were elected by state legislators. Um, so there was a sort of separation between the public and those who are elected. Again, these are sort of the aristocratic elements of the constitution. Um, so if I was going to be rewriting the constitution, um, I would say house terms should be four years. And I would say senators, you could, senators, I would maybe, maybe not directly apportioned by population because you do want to have the Senate as a check upon the house. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, because sometimes the house wants you to do crazy shit and the Senate goes, hold on, we're not going to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, like repealing the affordable care act and things like that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, or hurting people, you know, so, you know, cause it's a lot easier to do crazier things in the house than it is in the Senate. Um, maybe you would up it to five, that like every state gets five senators. Um, okay. or like, or it's apportioned by population, but like at a very minimum, every cent, every, every state gets two, but then like some can get up to five or something like that. You could do that. Um, or you could go back to the unicameral legislature idea and just do it with the house, the Senate all together, just have the house. Um, but I think that has its own problems. Cause again, I don't think the house is perfect. There needs to be a check upon the house and sure. maybe that's just like building more powers into the executive branch. I don't know. Um, and the founders were not above the idea of talking about the idea of having a multi-person executive. Like there, there were discussions about having the presidency be like a three, two or three person body and not just be one guy. Um, so there was sort of people who argued for more of a, um, unitary executive that was Hamilton, um, or people who were like, we need to have like a board of people. Yeah. Um, maybe we do that, or at the very least we have, an executive branch where you have like a president, a vice president, and then like a like a president ex officio or something, and it's like three. Or you give the vice president more powers. But there's certain things the vice president does, or certain things the president does. You can do all kinds of things like that. Yeah. Um, but uh yeah, if you guys want to learn more about what we could do to change the constitution, I highly, highly recommend um Gore Vidal's excellent essay from like the early eighties called The Second American Revolution, where he goes into all of this. Okay, um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Kerrigan also had a comment. Uh, shout out to Marxist Unity Group Caucus in DSA, whose main thing is to make a new constitution. Wonderful. This is good. I'm really glad that people on the left are thinking about how we would change the constitution. Because, I mean, I'm sorry, but like, I do genuinely believe like, if we were to have like a revolution in this country, um, peaceful or not, I mean, one of the things we have to do is to write a new constitution. Because the Soviet Union had a constitution, right? Like any 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 organized political force has some kind of governing overall governing document, um, and you can look at the Soviet Constitution and see a lot of good things in it, right? Like right. some of those guaranteed economic rights, like I discussed before. Yep. A lot of those were in the 1936 Soviet Constitution, and 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 Franklin Roosevelt, in his last couple of years of office, also argued for them. He called them the Second Bill of Rights. And argued for those economic protections. I'm, I'm so thrilled that they're doing that kind of work because I think it's essential. For sure. Uh, Zell Rock, VODs, said, Solve Sits like to quote the Magna Carta, 
but the country that wrote it died and it's not applicable whatsoever. That's true. Not to mention the fact that the, the Magna Carta was was very, very limited in what it gave. You know, it wasn't really a it wasn't really a government. It wasn't really a document for like the people. Right. It was more of a check upon the king by the nobles like that was, you know, it was still a deeply feudal document. But it's very important in, in that it was limiting the power of a unitary executive like a king. Yeah. Yeah. Which I feel like back sort of back to this centralized decentralized conversation aspect yeah. of it like i think the the more centralized like you maybe you can have a kind of a, a i don't know a kind of a government in a sense but like this idea that one person is in charge which is i mean we're seeing more and more trouble with it in the united states you yes. see trouble with it all over the place everywhere that you have one person in charge it it becomes like a dictatorship an authoritarian yeah. kind of nightmare I agree with you 100%. And I would say that the trouble with it is that sometimes it can be one person and sometimes it can be nine in, yep. in the case of the Supreme Court, right? Yep. So yep. the challenge is, and again, this is where I do kind of think the framers, the founders kind of had a certain level of genius here, is that you have a government in which no one branch has all the authority of the government and that there's constant there's a constant debate between the two branches. And then within those branches themselves, there are debates, like between the, the a debate between the House and the Senate, the debates between the Supreme Court and the federal district courts, the debates between the president and say like the president and a secretary of state or the president and the secretary of the treasury or the president and um, the Justice Department, right? Which by the way, the Justice Department is not something that goes back to the founded the country. It was founded during the Grant administration to go after the Klan. Um, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. Um, it was a, it was a tool of reconstruction to make the, to actually carry out the vision of a more equitable and just country after the ravages of the Civil War. So these all exist to counteract poor impulses of the other system. That, that's what makes it work. Yeah. It's also a detriment because there's certain things that just can't get done because of the gridlock that's built into the system. It's both good and then it checks power. And then it's bad in that it checks power because there's certain <laughs> things we just can't do. Right, right. Um, yeah. So Zalrog VODs and said uh, a check on the executive and judiciary branches in the U.S. would be good. I've been saying that for 20 years. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I mean, I've been saying that since the Bush era. Like, I mean, in the United States, uh, there's a one very, very key piece of legislation called the War Powers Act, which was in, passed in 1973 uh, or 1973, 74. Um, to counteract the problems of, of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which was the thing that was passed in Congress in 1964 that unilaterally gave President Johnson the power to, to, to fight the Vietnam War. And that was an absolute disaster. So Congress reasserted itself on the issue of war powers. And the War Powers Act severely limited where uh, the president, as commander in chief, uh, could deploy forces. So if they deployed forces a certain place, they could only be there for 60 days. And then if they're there for a longer period of time, then we'd have to actually formally declare war. Because the last time the United States actually formally declared war on a country was 1941. That was when we declared war in Japan. So every war that's been fought since then has not been done with a congressional declaration of war. It's been done either through like something like the Gulf of Tonkin Rev Resolution by under the, in the Vietnam era or the authorization for the use of military force, the AUMF, um, which is uh, which was something that was created after 9-11. Um, which is basically kind of a Gulf of Tonkin on steroids that allowed the Bush administration to both carry out Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, I'm with you on this a thousand percent. Um, as the founders really intended it in regards to the judiciary, the original goal was to have Congress regulate the judiciary, not the other way around. Right. Um, and so I would say that Congress reasserts itself on both of those branches of government. The president is not a king and the Supreme Court shouldn't be a group of sort of high priests and priestesses who sit on high that determine everything for 340 million Americans. Yeah, for sure. Um, some random geek said, uh, I wonder if anarchists have offered something of a guideline document for how to do government governance. There are at least some essays on democratic confederalism. That's very, very interesting. I know we might get into some of this a little bit when we do the last of our trilogy of videos and um, trilogy of, of episodes on Anton Panacek, the great Dutch oh, Marxist. Yeah. Yep. We're going to do his book workers council sometime right. in the fall. Um, yeah. I believe he gets more into this um, yeah. because if, 
Yeah, if I was redesigning like the national government of the United States, I would build workers' councils into the system. Um, so you'd have elected officials, but you would also have broad, clear guidelines for the development of workers' councils. Mm -hmm. um, for the democratic, like certain things would be decommodified. Like you would have like healthcare, energy, um, uh, you know, healthcare, energy, housing, certain things would be decommodified where there may be more state roles in those. And then for other things, the things you know, we don't necessarily need, but the things we want, we could actually have like a form of, of robust market-based socialism um, with strong worker controls and worker protections. Like you could do that. Mm -hmm. um, so it'd be kind of like kind of like Yugoslavia, the way Yugoslavia was, was structured, where you'd have sort of market socialism, but then you'd also have these broader social protections by the state. Um, with anarchists, I mean, basically you would sort of do away with the state part and then you would just have workers councils for everything, which yeah. maybe that would work too. I I'm not opposed to that. Um, yeah. I think all that really matters is what works, yeah. what, what, what creates a system that is democratic and just and, 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 um, where there's not a tyranny of the majority, nor is there a tyranny of the minority. Those yeah. are the two things you have to fight for in any system you build. And basically you have to build in checks upon either one of those. Yeah. What are your um, thoughts on that, Corey? Well, I mean, I, I particularly like, uh, like, uh, the guy, I can't remember his name. I can never remember his name. He kind of set up a Rojava. Uh, he was a big part of that. He, oh yeah. His so writings were based on, uh, Murray Bookchin's writings. Yes. I know you're talking about. It's like on a call or something like that. Yes. The, 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 he's like the guy. Oslan, you, or, Oslan or something. you can't say his name on the internet. Like it's the thing where people like block out his face or they block out his name because it gets like flagged by like the social media overlords right. or something. Um, I just can never yes. remember his name. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my whole thing is it's like you can develop broader macroeconomic policy mixed with strong democratic protections. I is. think you can do both those things. Abdullah, Abdullah Oslan. Oslan, yeah. Yeah. So that's like, and I know like there's um, Bookchin, there's Michael Albert who has some ideas on this too, um, who's, who's I think collaborated with Chomsky. Um, I, I'm, I'm very much more in the sort of workers' councils, council communism, anarcho-syndicalism. I'm much more in that camp right. because it's a way of creating, it's a way of creating structure and political order without creating the overweening capitalist state, like without directly reproducing the capitalist yeah. state. Yeah. Um, Anarch, uh, the YouTube channel Anarch, he's got a series on current existing uh, horizontal power structures throughout the world. And so if people want to check that out, there's lots of different examples. I haven't watched them all myself, but it's, it's cool stuff. Cool. 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 That's awesome. But, uh, we're at an hour 10. How much okay. is there more we want to get through or should we call her a night? There's, there's basically, I just want to talk about the three reports, Okay. their influence, and then we can be done. I will do this briefly. All right. So, so it's kind of the most important parts. So to do this quickly, like the constitution does provide broad powers for the creation of a, of a regulated economy. So like the, it, you know, it actually has provisions for the regulation of commerce. It has the provisions for infrastructure. It has provisions for what's called the general welfare clause, which is the big, the biggest loophole of all, which is fantastic because you can put anything under the general welfare, um, which would be good. Hamilton becomes secretary of the treasury in 1789. Um, after the constitution is ratified by the states and Washington is elected the first president. Um, and the first, and he does a series of three very influential reports one is the report on the public credit. The second is the report on a national bank. And the third one is the report on the manufacturers. The report on the public credit argues for a consolidation of the revolutionary war debts, assuming them from the states and having the national government regulate those debts and using that as essentially the development of a national credit line, which would allow us to essentially use that credit line to kind of create money in the sense that you will, you would be able to do more trade. If, right. if the nation could show that it could regulate its debts effectively, then it would show to other parts of the world that they could, they would be willing to do trade with us and vice versa. Um, so that's, that's really, really important is the report on the public credit. It eventually gets done. 
He gets the report on the public credit done, but it's done with this very grand uh, bargain that's done um, between Hamilton, James Madison, and Thomas Jefferson. They meet. Um, Madison, of course, is uh, controls at the time. Jefferson was, I think, the Secretary of State, and Madison was the head of the Virginia delegation in Congress. So these are two big power players. They meet and they make a grand bargain, which is the na- the national government will assume the revolutionary war debts of the states. Mm-hmm. In exchange, the national capital will be in the South, which is how Washington D.C. is put in a place of land between Virginia and Maryland. Right. So, um, so if, if Hamilton agreed to that, Madison would agree to, to that in Congress and, Je- and Jefferson would support it in the executive branch. That's how that gets done. Yeah. Great idea. A well-regulated debt is a national blessing. Um, people think of debt as being the worst thing ever, and it certainly can be, especially if, it, if inflation gets out of control. Right. But... Hamilton's assumption of the war debts takes a huge burden off of the states. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the tax burden on average Americans at that time goes down dramatically. Um, and so it helps them tremendously. The second thing is uh, the report on the National Bank. Um, and so in the report of the National Bank, in the previous, in the previous report on the public credit, on the public credit, he sort of alludes to the idea of a national bank. He's like, we can do all of this only if we set up a national bank. So he just assumed this is going to happen. So yeah. the second one, he lays out what a national bank would be. A national bank would work very much like the Federal Reserve System does today. It's quasi-public, quasi-private. Some of it's owned by the private, the private sphere and some of it's owned by the public. Mm-hmm. Having it split between the two was a check upon the abuses of either one. Because if it was fully public in the eyes of Hamilton, then um, then it could be uh, a, an avenue for abuse and grift um, and corruption. If it was completely controlled by the private interests, it could also be a system of graft and corruption. So he thought having this sort of balanced system with strong public provisions and strong private provisions together would work. Now, we can debate whether that's the case or not, but it actually was fairly successful. It worked for what it was doing. It was working for what it was doing, which was creating a national economy based on manufacturing and creating um, a national credit line. Yeah. So, the, so with it is developed the Bank of the United States. Um, and the Bank of the United States would issue the currency for the United States. It's very similar to the time to the Bank of England. This stays in place for decades. Um, so, And it becomes so... Um, Kind of, and so uh, it is signed into law in 1791 with a 20 year charter. That charter is then renewed. Um, But then by the time you get to the, um, you get to the presidency of Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson makes it his personal vendetta to destroy the National Bank because he sees it as the good Jeffersonian Democrat that he is, as a way of subverting the slave power and subverting the people i.e. the slave power. Yeah. Um, because having a national currency actually works for the public and that it creates more it creates broader trust in the system than having a system of state economy, state currencies. Which is exactly what happens when the Second Bank of the United States is dissolved in the in 1836. The year later is the Panic of 1837, which is one of the worst economic downturns in American history. Right. The country is thrown into economic chaos for decades. In the Civil War, you have a greenback system that's developed under the Union uh, government under Lincoln, which is fairly successful at the time. And then after that, the greenback system is largely retired. We go back to sort of a very deregulated banking system. And so between 1865 and 1913, um, the American economy goes through ravages of boom and busts, boom and busts, boom and busts. 1870s, 1880s, the Panic of 1892, 1893 is horrific, almost as bad as the Great Depression 30 years later. This all ends uh, with the the signing of the Federal Reserve Act in 1913 and the creation of the Federal Reserve System in 1914 under the Wilson administration, um, which is the system that we live under today. It is a national currency. It's the national bank. National banking works better for states than decentralized banking, yeah. period. Um, it creates more stability and confidence in the system. Um, so that's that. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about the report on the manufacturers, which is in 1791, which is the one that Perini spends a good time talking about, which is fascinating. Um, 
There is a quote that I want to share that I think is great. Um, the real story of American economic growth, and this kind of sums up our episode tonight. The real story of American economic growth, if honestly told, would diminish the role of individual action, c- competition, and self-interest while elevating the importance of cooperation, collective action, and planning. Yeah. Blunt truth offered by Ha Jun Chang bears repeating. If Hamilton were the finance minister of some developing country today, the IMF and World Bank would certainly refuse to lend money to this country and would be lobbying for his removal from office. Yeah. It's true. So, Hamilton uses the report of the manufacturers to essentially debunk a lot of the free market economists like Adam Smith and the French physiocrats um, and argues for a much more nationally backed system of direct development of manufacturing in the country. He believed that the future was manufacturing. And it was a balance between what we could do agriculturally in terms of exports of raw materials and the development of our own national markets. This would create broader prosperity for the country and would allow us to develop a national military to protect us from outside threats. Um, and so, uh, and so he has a variety of different ways to do this. So it's through like, um, you know, uh, protecting duties on foreign articles. So like it makes like basically like tariffs on exported goods to the country that make it more expensive than domestic goods. So you can develop the domestic um, manufacturing base Um, prohibitions on articles um, or other duties um, relating to like encouraging national manufacturing um, pro- pr- prohibiting exportation of certain materials. So um, you would keep the materials in the country and then use those to develop the national manufacturing base. Um, subsidies, um, which in the time were called pecuniary bounties, but direct subsidies to industry where you would, the federal government would essentially give them money to develop these industries, um, which is very un laissez faire. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, and then just, and, and then, cautious and intelligent taxation policies. Um, so these are all of the, those are, you know, the exemption of materials from certain duties. So, so from certain taxes, you wouldn't have certain taxes on certain, on certain raw materials or goods. Okay. Um, and then eventually the drawbacks of duties on certain goods. So like um, eventually as the in- national economic base is developed, manufacturing is developed, then we can eventually export out to the world which is eventually what happens. So by the time that you get to 1900 Mm -hmm. and 1901, the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, the United States is the net exporter to the world. We made more things than any other country and we sent them any more anywhere than any other country, maybe barring the British empire, but but we were the number one today. That is China. Right. Um, And the other one that I really love is the encouragement of new inventions and discoveries. Um, and so, and judicious regulations for the inspection of manufactured commodities. So he's talking for regulation. He's talking about direct subsidies to industries. He's talking about helping develop innovation. Yep. Um, because we think of innovation as being something related to market forces, but no, most of the time, a lot of great innovations, especially many of them that are in like smartphones were developed with public money. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and facilitation of transportation of commodities, the development of infrastructure, which at the time, the early republic was mostly the development of post offices and the post office system mm-hmm. um, and postal roads and postal routes that would then take goods across the country, including the direct subsidy of newspapers. Back in the beginning of the early republic, newspapers were subsidized by the federal government multiple ways. One, in discounted mailing rates, sometimes either for very little or nothing, and two, direct subsidies for the development of, of, of local newspapers. The federal government paid people to make local newspapers, right? which is something we should do again. For sure. Um, and so those are all of his proposals. A lot of them end up getting approved, but some of them do not. And then a lot of them do end up getting undermined during the Jefferson Jackson era right. um, of the slave aristocracy ascendancy and, and the, the, um, sort of the rejection of national economic policy. The last thing I'll mention is basically what is the legacy of Hamilton? The legacy of Hamilton is that Hamilton created the the most, Hamilton's system created the most dynamic, the most innovative, and the most dominant economic system in the world. And that's the United States. People, you know, the United States is still the number one economy in the world. We take, we go back and forth between China. Right. China, but and China's the way it is, 
precisely because of Hamilton's ideas of direct national economic policy and central banking. Yeah. All of that is all Hamilton. You know, the Bank of China is Hamilton. Right. The direct subsidy of industry is Hamilton. This is all planning. Um, you know, Hamilton was sort of a proto-socialist. And, 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 you know, I think probably would have described himself more as a sort of enlightened democratic capitalist. But like, he basically believed in a mixed economy. Right. He didn't right. believe in free market capitalism. He, yeah. he didn't. He thought free market capitalism was dumb and would lead to national ruin. And he's right. Yep. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, too, is that a, a couple other things. One, some of this is carried out by other Americans in the later period. So John Quincy Adams, who very much believed in a lot of Hamilton's ideas. Um, one thing that he ab advocated for was extension of internal improvements so like infrastructure. Um, and he also advocated for a national university. Um, John Quincy Adams wanted to develop a national university. Never happened, but it's something that I think is really cool that we should come back yeah, to. For sure. It's a neat, neat idea. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these ideas get picked up by Henry Clay, um, the, the great senator who creates what, it's what you think of as being the American system or the national system. This is heavily, heavily influential on the development of Germany okay. and the development of Japan. Yeah. So uh, Germany would take a lot of these ideas and develop them into uh, what they kind of called their own you know, economic system under once Germany, after the Franco-Prussian War, um, after 1871, Germany was no longer like a collection of kingdoms. It was a, a unified country. Uh, the mid 1800s is the development of national systems. So the three big countries that go from being sort of small amalgams of smaller states into nation states are Germany in 1871, Italy in the 1860s, and the United States mm -hmm. with the Civil War. Um, and so we, they all become national systems. There was a um, there was an economic theorist named Frederick List who brought a lot of these ideas of Hamilton's and Henry Clay's and the national system to Germany, and through the through the chancellorship uh, of Otto von Bismarck, institutes a lot of this national economic policy and industrial policy, which makes. Um, which, you know, Hamilton's policies made the United States the, the workhouse of the world. Um, Germany's policies directed by Hamilton's ideas made Germany the workhouse of Europe, which it still is today. When people think of, of quality, high-end manufacturing, of manufacturing, they think of Germany. Yeah. And that goes back to the, to the system. Same with Japan um, in the mid-19th century under the, the Meiji um, government, government um, that came into power. Um, the One of the leading theorists was a guy named Wakayama Norikazu, who was very influenced by um, Hamilton and Frederick Litz and another economist last name Carey. Um, when they came into power, um, they they would um, institute the phrase Fukoku Kiyohe, or wealthy country, strong military. And that was the, the Mijai restoration um, in the 18... Uh, in the late 1800s. Um, and so that is the, the legacy. If people want to see the legacy of Alexander Hamilton, as the columnist George Wilde says, look at around you. He yeah. doesn't need a statue. The world is his statue. Because for good or ill, I think Alexander Hamilton is arguably one of the most influential economic theorists in all of history. Yeah. Between the development of a national economy in, in America and with an emphasis on manufacturing to the development of a national banking system and the development of a national credit system. All of these are ideas that people play, put into play now. And interestingly enough, China is instituting a lot of the ideas of Hamilton and now they're eating our lunch. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, uh, so I think that's very important. So in my argument, we need to get back to Hamilton. And I would say, Get back to Hamiltonianism with socialist characteristics. There you go. Put more direct worker involvement, worker control, worker co-ops, worker councils with that strong macroeconomic policy, industrial policy. And that would make America um, and any other country, I think, pretty awesome <laughs> or any polity pretty awesome. So right that is radical Hamilton. I could have talked about this for eight hours. I 
love talking about Alexander Hamilton. He's one of my favorite historical figures. Um, and I think he's someone that um, more people should think about him when they think about the founders right. and less the slave owning Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, for sure. All right. So what are we covering next time? Next time, we are going to be kind of talking about some of those libertarian socialist ideas that we were discussing tonight. Um, we're going to be going, we're doing a little bit of a deep dive on Daniel Guerin, um, okay. the French Marxist, um, anarchist Marxist. His whole idea was that synthesis of anarchism and Marxism. Nice. Um, that great book that we covered, um, the, uh, the, the book on Marxist and anarchism, the sort of libertarian socialism episodes that we've done. We've talked a little bit about Guerin. Um, but we're going to talk about him more in his book, um, which I think is called For Libertarian Communism. Cool. Um, and and um, so I'm really excited to get back to talking a little bit about Garen, who is one of my favorite Marxists and one of my favorite sort of thinkers about this Thanks. idea of a libertarian socialism. Right on. And I guess that just leaves. Where can people find you? So you guys can find me at justinclark.org. My website's right down there. One thing I've been recently doing since we've last in my podcast is I'm compiling a lot of my short review, book reviews that I do on Instagram into blog posts. So the first two are up. Um, the first one is called Short Book Reviews, Science and Society. It's a variety of different books. And the second blog post that I've made is about Rick Perlstein's series on the rise of the American right um, uh, from Goldwater to Reagan. Um, and I'll be doing more and more of these sort of short review blog posts um, as I go forward. Um, you can also find me on social media. I'm at Justin Clark, PH. PH stands for public history. Um, and I'm mostly on Instagram, but I'm also on threads, blue sky, TikTok. Um, I'm less active on TikTok. I'm mostly active on Instagram where you can find, um, my posts on a variety of different things. Um, and I, and, uh, before we finish out, I just want to say, please consider becoming a patron of the skeptical leftist. Um, Corey does a lot of really hard work making all this happen um, so that I can <laughs> blather on about 1790s economic policy. Um, so uh, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash skeptical leftist. Um, that's where you can get the pre-games, the post-games, a lot of really special content that he's cooking up. Yeah. Um, so definitely be consider becoming a patron. And I also want to thank all of our commenters for your great comments and for questions sure. tonight. We really appreciate you uh, sticking in with this little longer episode tonight. Right on. Yeah, for sure. A uh, couple quick, quick uh, comments right here at the end. Karen sure. said, libertarian Marxism for the win. Absolutely. <laughs> and then uh, some random geek said, I love Daniel Guerin's book, uh, Fascism and Big Bis Business. I, I have that one too. I learned about that book and, and Parenti uses that a lot in Black Shirts and Reds. Um, and so I bought it a while back. Maybe that's another one that we do. Um, I have a few different books by him. Um, we might do like a, like we're doing with Panachuk, we might do a Garen series where we do two or three. Right um, I think would be interesting. All right. Thank you everybody for commenting and thank you, Justin, for all your uh, wonderful insight and actually doing all the reading for the show. <laughs> I know, no, no problem. I mean, this is like, I, this is fun. I, I enjoy doing this. Um, anytime that I can read about Hamilton and the early Republic, I can do that uh, any day. So, Corey, thank you so much. And thank you so much to our viewers. And uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks when we talk about Daniel. All right, folks, that's all for now. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it and it helps me keep the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Damian Marie at Hope, uh, Some Random Geek, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a sub stack where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then I would like on YouTube or a five-star rating on a, and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical leftist. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video. 
join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat. and that about that oh yeah Yeah. real quick so he talks about in hamilton's reading of history quote of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics the greatest number have begun their career by paying an obsequious court to the people commencing demagogues and ending tyrants this is good stuff and so what he says and he what he writes here prenti writes at times hamilton almost sounds like lenin and left-wing communism and infantile disorder in which the russian revolutionary criticizes the ultra left for making their desire their political ideological attitude for mistaking their desire, their political ideological attitude for objective reality. All they're ever going to do is put more power in their ha- their hands and more power and wealth into the hands of their fucking lackeys and friends. I say that with like the fact that like Jefferson is what's interesting is people often call Hamilton like an elusive founder. They're like, what do we know about him? It's like, I think he's a lot more un- easy to understand than H- Jefferson is. Jefferson's right. much more of an enigma because... Yeah. Jefferson is this man who writes all men are created equal and yet owned slaves that he, you know, and not just owned slaves, but had children with some of them. And like, it's like a whole messy thing. Right. And that goes into this. So like Madison, James Madison, fourth president, who was known as the father of the Constitution, he would become a sort of Jeffersonian Democrat. He would disown a lot of his own Federalist impulses. And again, it's because Hamilton, I mean, Madison owned slaves. 